He'll come sometime, do something. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Charlie. Feed over to Judges 13. We in Judges 13 through 16 today. Judges 13. All right, so this is our next judge. And this is Samson. We'll be looking at Samson. So we see the start of his life, being in verse 1, chapter 13, it says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. The Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. Wow, that's a pretty long amount of time. And uh, it says, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman, and said unto her, Behold now, Thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore before, beware, I, uh, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So we see something that's similar to what we've seen in the other accounts with regard to how um, Israel and God are in their relationship. And that is uh, one that you have Israel, again, turning away from God. Now, they <coughs> specifically say what they were doing other than they said that they did evil again in the sight of the Lord. More than likely... Considering the pattern that they've already established, they've probably gone back to idolatry. So they're back to worshiping idols, they're back to not really following God or not really being obedient to God's commands, uh, doing what is right in their own eyes, doing whatever basically they want and they felt was okay, uh, without any consideration with regard to what God has said in His Word very clearly, what He's already taught them, and what they've already experienced as far as not just that present generation, but generations before, that have told them as far as, hey, look, we had followed God, we turned from God, and then we were put into bondage. By the way, God had told them very clearly what happened to them if they departed from following the Lord. Okay, so it comes to pass, as it has already been told them, uh, not just from the Scripture, which is the most reliable account, but also from probably previous generation, and even generation that had come, that is presently, uh, living that had been delivered under uh, previous judges uh, by God. And so now they find themselves again in this position because they've turned from God. But here's something that's a little different. Uh, they have, after being 40 years in bondage, the uh, angel of the Lord come to a particular couple, and, well, right now to the woman, and then he's going to come to the man, and then he tells this couple that they're going to have a child, a male child, and he's going to be basically called of God, and he's going to be risen to deliver Israel. And this child, beyond just the fact that he's called of God, and he's going to be one that delivers Israel, has something that's specific and unique to him. He's got a vow, or he uh, doesn't specifically mention the word vow here, but he says that he shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. And so he's not to or at least the mother's not to ingest any unclean thing, and then uh, also she's not to drink strong drink, she's not to eat uh, anything or drink anything that is of the fruit of the vine. Well, right here it says just drink not wine, but when he gives the reaffirmation of what he had stated to the wife, to the man, basically she's not to eat or drink anything of the fruit of the vine. So no, nothing grape related. Uh, supposed to enter into her system, and it's supposed to be that obviously no unclean thing is supposed to come into him, and also something that's pretty unique. He's supposed to not cut his hair, right? so you don't give him a haircut. So um, that's pretty interesting. He's going to be a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> and also a fact is. 
you don't see this, at least it's not recorded, it's assumed probably, but you don't see this, is that Israel actually doesn't cry out to God. Or at least there's no recording in this instance of it. Mm. Uh, you have their in bondage 40 years, but you don't have, as with uh, even uh, the fourth uh, for, the fourth previous judge, which was Jephthah, where in that they would cry out to God, and then God said, hey, I'm done dealing with y'all. Not the judge you want, but the judge you need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so God actually is the one that initiates the sending of the judge and the calling forth of the judge. Oh, well, he's done it all prior, but most of the time, it's been, with the exception of Jephthah, it's always been in a response to the people crying out, calling out for somebody to deliver them. In this case, it seems that they've conceded to the fact, hey, we're fine with living in bondage. Now, we see that a little bit. It go to Judges 14. Judges 14. Oh, I'm sorry, 15. 15. Judges 15. Go to Judges 15. Um, starting at verse 9. It says, And then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are you come up against us? And they answered, To bind Samson, we are come up uh, to do to him as he had done to us. Then three thousand men of Judah went to the top of the rock of Etam and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? Now mind you, this is many years obviously following that, because right now he hasn't even been born. Uh, he hasn't even been conceived. He's, the angel of the Lord has approached the parents, and then the uh, angel of the Lord told him, hey, you're going to have a son, he's going to deliver Israel. And then beyond that is that he's, he's going to be a Nazarite from the womb, so then you're not supposed to do these things. Now, at this instance, this is many years obviously following, he's a grown man, and then now he's being used of God to stir up between Israel and Philistines because God doesn't want Israel to be under bondage. That was never his plan, uh, at least not anything long term. The intent for them to go into bondage was so that so they would cry out to him and he would deliver uh, and hopefully they would turn, obviously turn back to him. Uh, but their, his intent was never to have people there would just be under bondage and to be like everybody else going and worshiping idols so that they would be destroyed. You know, he's come to give life and life more abundant. Um, but anyway, so at this instance, you have men of Judah, 3,000 men come, uh, went to the top of uh, Rock Etam, and they said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines uh, are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? Okay, what is this that thou hast done unto us? So this is their mentality and their mindset throughout this time. They've been 40 years in bondage, and then following... I would assume probably 20 years of that from the time that Angel of the Lord came to Samson's parents, to Noah, and then you have uh, after his birth, obviously, and then his raising up, and then now you have this incident where um, it's one of many where basically Samson kills a number of Philistines in response to something that they had done uh, to him. And it was a, of the working of the Lord, basically, to stir up strife between the two so that, that he would have cause to go ahead and destroy them. Um, and so now they approach, and they see themselves, hey, look, these guys are ruler over us. They have power over us. They're our masters. Why are you stirring up trouble? <coughs> and then, well, his response is basically, you know, I'm going to do them what they did to me, which is factual. It's just regarding of the incident. But their mentality was that we're fine with being in bondage. In other words, don't stir up trouble. They're going to hurt us. They're going to destroy us. And they forgot the fact that, hey, wait a minute. We're not to be like this. We need to turn. And the only reason we're like this, this isn't normal. It's not normal for them to be in the bondage. It's not normal. It should be normal, at least. It's not God. It's, go ahead. That doesn't wait to you finish your sentence. No, I was going to say it wasn't God's intended plan for them to be. Um, only under the fact that they were in sin. And it was a, a means for them to cry out, but it wasn't God's overall intended plan for them. Obviously, they know who Samson is, and they have a relationship with him. They know who he is when they come up. They, they've already made the assumption that he's going to permit them to bind him and, or, and to you know turn him over to the Philistines. They came up to ask him the permission. So they have a relationship with him. 
so then probably obviously they know who he is as far as his birth goes that he was born of a barren mother and that he's specially called for the purpose of being their judge or their deliverer so really their betrayal uh, their betrayal of Samson their willingness to be in bondage um, they're rejecting God's judge or God's deliverer for them is very, very, um, as far as I can tell, they, they really know what they're doing. Their satisfaction with not living God's plan for their life, not having the deliverer that God has for them, their satisfaction with living in bondage is with full knowledge. They, they know what it is that they're doing. And I, you know, there's the application obviously is really, really similar to what we see in a lot of Christians' lives who know this isn't God's best, what I'm doing. And uh, God has better for me. I'm good with bondage. It also makes me wonder before this time, they had tried to revolt several times in their own power and not calling upon God and failed. And so then. Maybe not that they wanted to be in bondage, but that they had resigned themselves to it, thinking and and were unwilling to put their trust in God yeah, no to deliver them. Yeah, they didn't have faith in God for it. That's true. That's another good point. And you see it. You see it in nations. You know, I look at nations today that we try to help as Americans or as. Um, you know, as even as Christians, we want to. We see the dire need, the economic need, and the disaster that people are in, uh, politically and with war and with just persecution, terrible things. But one of the problems with trying to help people is you help a faithless people. They only accept what's just given to them, but there's no desire in the heart to say, okay. We'll undergo persecution for freedom, or we will, you know, the, if we get this, it's worth the sacrifice, and if we don't get it, dying is better. You know, for and really for a believer, there's a needful mindset of death to self, death to this life, and a reality of how much greater eternity is than the temporary life. I was thinking yesterday about longevity of people just different time the different ages that God gives people to live on the serve and how I've met people that have in in many ways in their in their minds they have been given by God the verdict of you get a short life you know they get cancer they get something and they know they're going to die and how some people just embrace God's plan and his grace for that and other people just panic and uh, and respond by being bitter against God because they thought they should get 80 or 90 or 100 and they're only going to get you know 40 or 50 or 60 or whatever years and they're so bitter and angry against God even Christians even people that profess faith in Jesus Christ and I guess the reminder about it is is that we are so capable of being so short-sighted that we think that the satisfaction and that the means is going to be in this life when eternity is in an instant better than this life. One instant in eternity will surpass everything in this life with regard to satisfaction, desires, fulfillment, all these things. We don't want to go to heaven. We don't want to die. You know, we have this vitality for a life which is a living in a body of death. You know, and we want, man, we just want, man, you know, we want to live longer and longer and longer. And I I have it in me. We all, I think we all have a natural propensity to want to live because we don't see that we're alive forevermore. And uh, anyway, it's just, there's a lot of really great application for me about, you know, this is not as good as what it's going to be. And so I'm not holding on to anything here. And there's just a freedom that you can live when you're not afraid to die. And these people are afraid to lose their meager bondage. Because, you know, they might die. These Philistines might kill us. They might do terrible things to us. That's no way to live. 
It's not living. So. Anyway. I don't. <laughs> it isn't. I can understand the mentality, and that's I because I it's uh, the large. Well, from an unbeliever's perspective, it's large part because of who wants to die and go to hell. <laughs> you know that. You know that's where you're going when you die. So the thing is, it's like you'd want to prolong your life that much longer. Uh, from a believer's standpoint, that's just lack of faith. That, okay, what God says about our eternity and what we have coming to us and what we have awaiting us is a lot better. Uh, but, okay, so he's set apart. From we, birth. we could use some kamikaze Christians. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, not like with a death wish, but like literally living, you know, with I'm a. <laughs> you know, I'm headed for paradise. I'm going, I'm all out. I'm not saying committing suicide. I don't think, you know, the kamikazes had death wish. They just had cause. And in their mind, that cause was worth dying for. And they were wrong. But we have a cause that's worth dying for. And we can't be wrong about that. Sure. <laughs> so we see with Samson... Israel was under bondage, and he is called of God from his womb, practically prior to his conception, uh, to deliver Israel. Uh, next, we see that though he knew better, he allowed his temper and lust to sidetrack him from basically God's best. Now, with regard to his temper, God used his temper. Uh, we see it in 1419. And then in 15 verses 4 and 7, and then the first four chapters of 16, or first four verses of chapter 16. But in 14, 19, uh, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them, and took their spoil, and gave change of garments unto them, which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up uh, to his father's house. Okay, so this is the account of he had taken a wife of the daughters of Timnath. Okay, now. It doesn't appear that they had consummated their marriage yet. Uh, he had taken her to wife, uh, but they hadn't necessarily consummated it. We see verse 5, Then Samson went down his father and his mother to Timnath, to the vineyards of Timnath. Behold, a young uh, lion roared against him, and the uh, Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he rent his key, as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told out his father and his mother uh, what he had done. And uh, he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. Uh, he would later come, uh, he's going to pass by the lion that he killed, and he's going to see honey inside of the stomach of the lion, and so he digs it out, um, not, touching the in, not touching the actual corpse, but rather just being, uh, being able to pull it out. Now, part of his vow, or part of, his, part of also the fact, which wasn't mentioned, but as far as he's not supposed to touch any unclean thing, okay, which a dead animal on the side of the road is unclean, even though he was the one that killed it. Um, it would be unclean, and so he goes and he pulls honey from it, and uh, he eats of it. He, uh, this is just kind of thrown in the middle. When he goes down to uh, Timnath to basically party it up uh, because of the fact that he is, he's, I guess, declared married here at this point, um, Then he, 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 he gives a riddle to the folks that were there. Um, so uh, verse 15, it says, It came to pass on the seventh day that they uh, said unto Samson's wife, Entice thy husband, that he may declare unto us a riddle, lest we burn thee in thy father's house with fire. Uh, have you called us to take that uh, that we have? Is it not so? And then Samson's wife wept before him and said, Thou us, but hate me and lovest me not, and put forth the riddle unto the children of my people, has it not thou told me? And then uh, he said unto her, Behold, I have not told it my father nor my mother, shall I tell it to thee? And then so she keeps pressuring him, and so he goes in and tells her, and they, she tells it to the folks, and then um, there was an agreement, basically, if you 
are not able to tell it within a certain time frame, then you're going to give me 30 changes of garment. If not, then I'll give you 30 changes of garment. So they found it out, and he gets mad at the fact, well, you guys found it out through treacherous means, which was you... Yeah, you plowed with my heifer, is what you did. Yeah. You, you called her a heifer, you plowed <laughs> with my heifer. If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have not found out. And so he gets mad about it. So he goes down to a neighboring town, kills 30 Philistines, takes their garments, and then hands it up and says, here you go. And then what happens is that the Philistines find out, okay, what they had done, they come back, um, and they are going to kill her, basically, and they kill the house. Well, this, there's going to be another incident following it. Sorry, we go to uh, chapter 15, verse 1. It says, but it came past within a while after, in the same time, uh, in this time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. And he said, I will go into my wife, into the chamber. But her father would not suffer him to go in. And the father said, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And Samson said, concerning him, now I shall be more blameless in the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And so now he's got to get the 300 boxes, tie them together, put a firebrand in the tail between the tails, and then he's got to let them loose on the crops. And then uh, they're going to burn, it's basically they're gonna, he's going to start a big fire, burn up their crops. And so following that, he goes up to the top of the rock of Etam, and then what happens is that's when the Philistines come and they approach, which we read a little bit earlier, uh, around Judah, and then the men of Judah come up to him, and so he goes down, and then he agrees to let himself be bound. He gets turned over, and then he kills at least a thousand of them beyond that, because uh, he's going to break forth his bands, he fights and kills, and then he finds a jawbone of a donkey, kills at least a thousand of them with a jawbone of a donkey, and then he finds himself being thirsty, he cries out to God, God gives him water from out of the jaw of the donkey, and then um, says that he judged Israel for 20 years. Now, his wife in the process of that was burned with fire along with the, the household of the father, so they were all killed off. So now he's a free man. Um, and then we go into ju uh, Judges 16. That says, Then Samson went to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. That, uh, they compassed him and laid in wait for him all night at the gate of the city and were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. And Samson laid till midnight, rose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them. Bar and all put them upon his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. And then it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Okay, so we see him having uh, desires for women that are not Israeli. Now, in particular here, Israel had been given command as far as to not to take foreign women. Okay, strange women is how the Bible terms it. The reason for that is because they would turn his heart. And that's not just specific to him, that would be just specific to Israel. They would turn, their, their heart would be turned away uh, because if they weren't Israelite. Uh, and by the way, they could have, as with you see in Ruth, or as in with Rahab, become Israelite. They could have been cross -like. in other words, they could have called on God and believed on the God of Israel and had been followers of the God of Israel. Uh, so it's not like uh, God's being prejudiced here, but rather it was an issue that their heart would be turned away onto idols, and he was trying to prevent that being the case. So he made specific command that, you know, you're going to have to take, we see it in the New Testament as far as that, you're going to have to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And so you don't want what communion have light with darkness, or Christ with Belial. Uh, you don't have, you know, servant to sin, and then, you know, somebody that's living for God, serving to God, you know, can two walk together and say they'd be agreed. I mean, you reach out, uh, but the fact is you're not going to be in a close and intimate relationship because then your heart's going to be turned. Uh, it's usually not the other way around. That's more the exception than it is the rule. Um, and so he, they had, had specific 
uh, command as to obviously not seek foreign women, strange women, and it's primarily because of the heart being turned away from God, or a heart that would want to seek out other gods rather than seek the true and living God as a result. And so uh, he allowed his temper and his lust to sidetrack him, and we see that. Uh, he goes after a harlot, uh, the woman at Timnath that he sought. Now, mind you, that was under the Lord's directive because he sought an occasion uh, against the Philistines. Uh, but here, the following that you have where he pursues a harlot, and then he pursues uh, this woman of Sorek, Delilah, who we would see uh, is going to be used as far as in his downfall. Uh, he reveals to her that uh, his power is within his, the length of his hair. She is treacherous enough to try and get him uh, basically killed numerous times. And then finally she is able to have to where he loses his power before. And then he's taken over by the, he's, he's taken captive by the Philistines. The Philistines put out his eyes and then they have him as sport uh, down in, They brought him down to Gaza, okay, so they had him in a prison house where he was grinding down at Gaza. And he would not be there in that position had he not allowed his temper and his passions, primarily his passion, his lust, uh, to go ahead and be a controlling factor in his life. Now this is somebody that has been used of God to, de to deliver Israel. He's been used of God to... Uh, you know, to, <laughs> uh, to judge Israel. I, for the course of his life when he died, he would, he would have judged Israel for 20 years. This was somebody that was supposed to be dedicated to God from birth. Uh, and here he is uh, just walking. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we are in Judges chapter 16. Good morning. But he is giving over to passion and to his lust. And as a result, he finds himself, now mind you, this is somebody that is looked upon by the Philistines themselves that they have fought and they have died to, a number of them, as, okay, this is Israel's deliverer. And here's the guy. Now he's grinding at the prison house. And then he's, he's basically like a, uh, there was a, when I was a kid, we would go to Santa's Enchanted Forest down in Kendall. And they would have, of the many things that they would have there, they had a booth in particular where they had this guy that had like a little pet monkey that would jump around. You could take pictures or whatever. And then he would have like a little jack-in-the-box. And so they would put music, and then he would like dance around. And then he would play with the jack-in-the-box, and the thing would pop open or whatever. And then he'd have like all these reactions. And he, he had trained the monkey to be able to kind of do all kinds of neat tricks. Like, kind of like if you've ever seen somebody do with a dog, Boom. And then the dog like falls out and rolls on his back and stuff like that. So this is how they're using Samson, uh, deliverer of Israel, somebody that's been called God from birth, uh, somebody that's supposed to be dedicated and set apart from God uh, in a very unique manner, and actually somebody that had been used of God uh, to, to deliver Israel. And here he is, just a clown, you know, for our amusement. And he's in that position because of his passion, because of his lust that he couldn't control. Actually, he refused to allow it to control. He chose to not control it. He chose to say, you know, this is more satisfying and pleasurable to me than actually doing the will of God. And so, um, the Bible tells us in Galatians that, you know, walk in the Spirit, you, know, you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. In Ephesians, we're also told that, uh, you know, we're supposed to be not drunk with wine, where in excess, is, where in is excess, but you know, be filled with the Spirit. And so, we allow our passion and our lust, the only thing that that's going to lead to is going to be death. Now, eventually, it would lead him to his death, but, um, and death being just a separation, the thing is we're not going to be obviously walking in the power of God or having God bless our lives. Um, if 
we are walking in our passion and our lust. And then third, finally, it says, though used of God, he allowed his selfishness to ultimately destroy him. And we see that uh, towards the end of chapter 16. Uh, go to verse 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may at once... Uh, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon the house, uh, upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords, and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. So that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty remarkable. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down, took him, and brought him up, and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael, and the burying place of Manoah, his father, and he judged Israel twenty years. Now mind you, he is listed as one of the individuals that lived by faith, used of God, if you go to Hebrews 11, uh, doesn't mention necessarily specifically, it just says that, you know, shall we, what shall I more than say regarding individuals that had lived by faith. Uh, beginning in verse... 32. Third, yeah, and then what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah, and of David also, and of Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, Quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valley in fight, and then turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others you know, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And then it's going to go on and list a number of others that actually didn't get to see the things fulfilled in their lifetime, and it seemed, by all human standards, that, you know, wow, these guys were like miserable failures. Uh, but nevertheless, they were you know, considered ones that had had good testimony before God and then they, they they died in faith. But he's mentioned here as having one as having been one that wrought righteousness. Now mind you that'd be cool to have that be said of you and to be, you know, annotated in scripture. But <laughs> do you really want to go out like that? I'm serious. Okay. You're being a clown for entertainment of the Philistines, okay? The people that have had your people in bondage because you guys turned to sin. You know, and here are the guys that, mind you, God has specifically called you and raised you up to deliver out of their hands. Now you're in their hands as a, as a clown for their entertainment. And it's because you said, well, you know, I'd rather live according to my flesh rather than live for God. And that points in large part to his selfishness. It wasn't just, okay, his passion is left, but also the fact that he says, okay, I value what I want and my desires more than what God's desires for me are. Okay, why would he, uh, quote unquote, play loose? You know, not just with his morals, but also with it. We see, okay, with the lion, when he killed the lion and he would go back and then he would pluck the honey out of the lion. I'll be honest with you, honey, fresh honey is really good. <laughs> but I don't know that it'd be very appealing to me, coming from the, you know, the body of a dead lion, and let alone the fact that he's under. Uh, well, they all were. Any Israelite would have been. They would have known. Okay, that's unclean. And if you were somebody that's conscientious about keeping right with God, you wouldn't want to, you know, sully yourself with that. But he's like, you know, he goes and he's he's playing loose with that. Uh, he goes after a harlot. Uh, here's a guy that was used, you know, um, he had better potential to have ended well uh, above most any of, most any other person because he was specifically called of God uh, and he was, they were given specific instructions as far as how to raise him so it wasn't like he didn't know any better, um, but yet he chose to say, hey, you know, I want what I want more than what God wants for me. And so ultimately, you know, who knows how long he would have lived 
or how much longer he could have actually led Israel or judged Israel, or how greater he would have, you know, had victory over uh, Philistines. In his death, he was used to go ahead and destroy Philistines more so than he ever had in his entire, in the entirety of his life. But he still ended up, in a sense, I guess you could say, committing suicide. Uh, and dying with the Philistines as their clown for their pleasure and entertainment and as a means for them to mock the true and living God, you know, who really they were fighting against when they were fighting Israel. Okay, so from Samson's life, you see that um, though us, you could say, oh, maybe we're not, we don't have that same call. We didn't have an angel of the Lord come through our mom and dad and say, hey, this is, you know, the person that's going to, you know, deliver Israel. Well, no, mind you, we're not living under the same dispensation that they are. So Israel is set aside temporarily. But uh, what we do have is we do have a call from God, and that is uh, before the foundation of the world, uh, God in Christ had already had a plan to deliver mankind. And so God's desire is for every single solitary person on planet Earth prior to his return that they would come to trust in him. And then also following that is that God's desire and God's plan is that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Okay, so as one that would have trusted Christ already, God's got your life planned out for you. And it's really, the onus is on us to be able to find out what it is that he wants. Now he's made, obviously, a number of things very clear. And the easiest thing to do as far as that's concerned is that we would trust him and that we would seek him. In Romans 12, we're told that uh, if we surrender ourselves to him and then we allow ourselves to be conformed, or rather we allow our minds to be transformed, that we'll be able to prove, you know, what's that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. And so in other words, prior to be able to finding out God's will for my life, I first must surrender and obviously have my mind transform, I allow it to be transformed daily by the renewing um, through, through his word. He says in his word also that, now these are very common verses I would think, but, uh, you know, um, trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not in thy own understanding for him. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So I get direction when I lean on him, and I don't lean on myself, I don't trust in myself, but rather I, I, I lean on him, I seek to know him. Uh, that's what the acknowledging is. is I seek to know God in every situation, and He's gonna He's gonna give me direction. You know, His word is a light unto me, a light unto my path. Um, so, if we were pursue God, and then we won't, we will end up like this. Uh, but also beyond that is that we don't allow our lust to sidetrack us, or no, we we put into check our flesh. Uh, and that comes from a purposeful decision, a choice of our will to say, hey, I am going to live for God today. I'm going to walk in the Spirit today, now, daily. And if we were to do that, and then we're not going to end up in that position. And if we don't want to end up also as well, uh, we surrender our life for God. So in other words, um, anybody that's going to pursue the Lord Jesus, he said uh, that, you know, any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Okay, so denial of self is crucial in order to be able to see God's will activated in my life. Um, Alright, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, if not, Okay, we are going to look at Micah, the next judge, for next week. Right. We're dismissed. Thank you. Oh, Charlie.